to another episode of the Bob Shea and Yaya Travel the World Show. It's a place where we like to spend some time talking about all things travel and how travel can be part of your lifestyle, whether you're hanging out at home or you've got boarding passes in your hands. My name is Alex and I play the Bob Shea role. I'm a travel junkie who loves to share my experiences as a travel blogger and a travel coach. As always, I'm here with my bestie, Terry. That's right. I'm the bestie. I play the yaya in this thing. We are here today and we are chatting about all these great souvenirs that you can get all over the world. We're so excited. There's so many things to choose from. It's just hard to pick one thing that interests us. But as always, we're ready to share some of the things that keep us travel happy. We're going to talk books. We're going to talk food, travel tips, and products that we love. And it's all going to start with this little portion we like to call Now Boarding. Today in Now Boarding, we are talking all about the travel souvenirs, all the stuff that we like to bring back. Terry, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite words in Greek. Are you ready? I'm ready. Sata. Do you know what that means? Crap. It means crap. <laughs> that's right. Because sometimes the travel souvenirs can be crap, and that's not what we want. No. We, we want good stuff, right? And yes. I think that leads to our very first travel tip, which is... Buy items that you truly love. Something that brings you joy. So yeah. make sure whatever you're getting is something that you want. Yeah, and that like it has a use, right? Because stuff sitting on a shelf that you have to dust only gets annoying. Yeah, or yeah. or bring you joy because I will say, I did get a great souvenir from a person. Mm-hmm. It's a little Freddie Mercury that mm-hmm. he sits there at my desk. And I do dust him off every now and then. So, like I said, something that sparks joy in you and brings you. What is something that you find very interesting when you're traveling out and about? What is something that you kind of go and search for? Well, for me, I like to go and find books by uh, local authors So I like to go into those little independent bookstores or maybe go to local events and you can find things that are particular to the area in which you're visiting. Yeah, I agree with you completely because I think that's true for adults and kids. I bought a great book at the Munich airport one time. Was it Munich? No, Frankfurt. And it was the most concise history of the world. And it was like this comical book from this German sense of humor sensibility. It was very funny. So I I do agree with the whole book thing. And a lot of our 10 books in 10 minutes start out as books that I have found at a local bookshop or in the place that I'm actually at because they make such a difference. Right. You know, right. Yeah. Um, my biggest travel tip when it comes to souvenirs is know your shipping options to, so that you can keep your travel light. I mean, I can't even imagine going like 21 days in three countries and schlepping, which is a very important word to me, schlepping all kinds of stuff around that you could have shipped home had you known that that was an option. Right. Like when you were in Poland and you made pottery, you didn't want to lug that around with you. Exactly. And so we were very lucky because our hotel was literally two doors down from the local post office. And with all of their loving help, I packed everything up and sent it home. Uh, we all did, as a matter of fact, because we all bought so much. And I will say I have learned my lesson that pottery needs to be packed in small boxes, many small boxes, and not like one large box with a lot of packaging, because it was a little bit of a nightmare when I got home. And it can be, 
you know, a horror show, I went out to this factory, like we trekked out into the country to this factory. And when we got out there, they even let us make our own plates. And so when we shipped everything home, I thought, oh, it'll be more economical if I put it all into one box and ship it rather than several. No, wrong, wrong. Mine was the only box that came home and I probably had half my pieces broken in some form or another. And some Mm -hmm. of them I was able to fix and others I had to get quite creative with. Um, Some of them were rather crushed and I wound up kind of crushing them even more. And I took it and made like this mosaic tray with very all the different pretty. patterns. It's very on pretty. It. Yeah, everybody kind of likes that that story. So, you know, you never know what is going to happen. But I wish I had known a little bit more about how to ship things. But I am glad that I knew what my shipping options were because I couldn't imagine lugging all of that pottery back with me by hand. It would have been out of control. And it really wasn't like a money buster either to send it. It was like less than a hundred dollars. And considering how cheap the pottery was, it really, it wasn't that big of a deal. But I do, if I am bringing stuff home, I do use a hard shell suitcase. I'm not a fan of the soft-sided suitcases. I like a hard shell suitcase. The one that I have right now, and again, this is not affiliate for us. I have the Samantha Brown one off of the Home Shopping Network. And I will say I am quite delighted with it. It, it is. Tra- it traveled to Africa and Europe, and it did quite a good job. So it's been on three continents, and I'm pretty happy with well, it. You know, the, the hard shells are not what you think they used to be. They're not heavy at all. Right. They're so yeah. lightweight. I agree. I find that they just, your things look better and it, it just all around, it's just a far better quality suitcase. So I would definitely consider consider that in your travels for sure, especially when it comes, if you're somebody who likes to pick up travel souvenirs and Terry, yeah, yeah, you can tell everybody my house is literally its own travel souvenir. They're like oh, it in is. every corner. Yeah. In every place you look. Yeah, my kids make fun of me and they call it a museum. Yeah. (laughs) But it's memories. It is. For me, it is for sure. And I am an out of the box thinker when I bring things home. I bring all kinds of stuff home. There are certain foods that you can't bring home. However, you can bring prepackaged dry spices home. You can bring oil home. I will say this though be careful. My mother years and years and years ago went and to the place where Greek oregano comes from, this mountain in Greece. And she pulled some of the dry oregano and put it in a Ziploc bag. So it wasn't packaged like normal. I bought it at a store or a tourist shop kind of oregano. And she got to JFK International Airport and she got flagged because they thought it was pot. And it was this beautiful, special, gorgeous oregano. And thankfully, I can say this all these years later. This is more than 25 years ago. I will tell you that she was like, but it's oregano from the mountain in Greece. And thank God that the guy took a whiff of it. And he's like, oh my gosh, go make pizza. <laughs> he was an Italian and he was like, it's oregano. She's fine. But you you need to be careful with those kind of things so that you know. Yeah, you that- definitely need to know your food restrictions, what's yeah. allowed to be brought back, because you sure don't want to go buy stuff and then get there and get it thrown out. Exactly, exactly. But, you know, circling back to the idea of knowing your shipping options, we took a vacation in Alaska. And one of the things that my boys did was they went fishing for halibut. So the the big, huge fish. And they caught them. And the company that we chartered through, we really didn't kind of understand the situation until almost the end. The company we chartered through actually included in the price processing the whole fish for us. So cutting it up and gutting it, everything 
flash freezing it for us and shipping it to our doorstep. So we wound up with all this beautiful, wild caught, fresh fish from Alaska. And, you know, they're huge fish. Mm -hmm. And we wound up with a freezer full that lasted us like so long. And it was such a great experience on top of that. So when you're going into those situations, make sure you kind of know the whole story. I say from experience on that one. Let me share experience on the other side of the coin. Mm -hmm. As a child, we traveled extensively. And my mother, she loved souvenirs. The more, the better. Okay. Mm -hmm. We didn't look at our shipping options. I can remember as a child wearing a huge sombrero on the plane back because that's what my mother wanted. Mm -hmm. And I think now, oh, my gosh, what did we look like? (laughs) You know, dragging all these bags on, this young girl wearing this ginormous sombrero. You know, there's so many other options out there. Make sure you know them. It makes your trip so much better. It does. I <laughs> I could totally picture it in my head too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I yep. I could totally see it. Alex here from the editing studio. You know, Terry and I, Bob Chi and Yaya, started talking all about travel souvenirs in this particular episode. And we really focused in on two important tips. Thinking about books as really legitimate travel souvenirs, and also how to ship things from no matter where you are in the world and making sure that you know about that. We told a lot of stories with that, but to tell you the truth, the one travel souvenir I have is one that you'll never believe. I've included that story here, and I hope that you enjoy it. You know, stories like this and the storytelling that we do in our podcast means a lot to us, and we hope that it inspires you to keep on travel dreaming during these times when maybe we can't get those boarding passes as quickly as we'd like. So here's a story about my best travel souvenir ever. I hope you enjoy it. The best souvenir I ever got was one I didn't want. It was way too expensive. It was a complete luxury item. Most of all, it added to my already overwhelming schedule. I mean, let's face it. Usually we bring home a few little trinkets so that we can smile fondly and remember a great experience. We do not bring home obligations. In fact, I recently participated in a Zoom show and tell for travel souvenirs. People bought all kinds of things, kitchen gadgets, cultural tchotchkes that represent a faraway place. That was so much fun. Actually, I had participated with my beloved Freddie Mercury Kokeshi doll that I found in the Plaka in Athens, a very clever find, but not my best souvenir. Let me rewind just a bit. My husband and I had decided to move to Japan based on Uncle Sam's insistence. We had three elementary-aged kids at the time who were all, bless them, handfuls. On top of relocating, the settling in would be entirely up to me as my husband would ship out often with his command. We were dealt a few blows during this particular relocation, the biggest one being that we would need to live on the economy instead of in base housing. That story was for another day. Anyway, Lee signed, electric turned on, and moved in. About one year later, I collapsed for a nap while my husband took the kids out for a little fun at the local superstore complex called Viva Home. Then it happened. Big news was headed my way. My nap was interrupted by the bustle of three kids being reminded to take their shoes off and struggle to remove their coats quickly. There was news and they needed to tell me, Mom, Mom, Ryan found a puppy. You've got to be kidding me. Seriously, I literally started praying. Lord, I'm doing my best here and I've got quite a full plate as you can clearly see. This would be a really good time for you to intervene. There is no way on God's green earth that I was getting any sort of puppy. Let me say that again out loud. There's no way on God's green earth that we are getting a puppy. 
thanks for making me the bad guy in this. What in the world could you have been thinking? Don't you think I'm overwhelmed as it is? Unfortunately, my mom filter was not working. Babe, you got to see this little puppy. Really? You leave in a month for deployment. Oh, little did they all know that I had a concrete out that was just waiting to be used at just the right moment. Nope, 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 no puppy in my future. Fine, I'll go see the puppy. Let me just run and get my heartless, unfeeling self together, and we'll go see the puppy we are not getting. Folks, this was the cutest puppy I ever saw in my life. And interestingly, the guy running the pet department was really happy to see us. Maybe happy wasn't the correct word. He looked relieved. So I held the puppy and she was everything a puppy hungry person could hope for. She had a cute, curious little pointy ears. Her tail curved up into a perfect circle and she was the perfect amount of white floof. Not too prissy, but not too laid back either. I had three kids to get to school every day, plus I needed to teach 23 second graders, then get everyone back home again, as I happily took advantage of every cultural opportunity that Japan had to offer. A puppy? They were crazy, and my husband was their leader. Well, I'd love to get this puppy, I mused, but our lease does not allow for any dogs. I told you, right? Concrete. Case closed. No dog, no more adding to my workload. It was over. Spoiler alert, it was not over. I was whined at. I was pestered. They got their big tears out. I was not budging and neither were they. To put it to an end, again, I said the following. If the puppy is still there when we move into base housing, we will get it. Agreed. My plan was working again. We were number 34 on the list, and that dog would be bought and long gone before anything would happen. That night, I got online to look up this strange little puppy breed that I had never really heard of before, Shiba Inu, a Japanese breed used to hunt in the foothills of Mount Fuji. Shibas are very cat-like. They are not recommended for the novice dog owner. Shibas are the national breed of Japan. Expect to pay about $1,700 for a well-bred puppy in the Tokyo area. We are so not getting this dog. Well, turns out God has a sense of humor. The next day, I picked up our mail on base. Sitting on the very top of the stack was our letter detailing our quarters assignment on base. Holy mother of Buddha, how in the world could this have happened? More importantly, how could I hide the information? Too late, my husband had gotten the call while I was at work. I made my gamble and I had lost. I admit that I was not a good loser. The entire drive, I peppered them with questions. Who will walk her? Who will give her a bath? And who exactly will be in charge of the kennel training? I got the typical, can we get a dog answers, knowing that the whole time the real answer was, no surprise, me. Our guy in the pet department once again looked relieved to see us. In broken English, he asked if we wanted to see the Sheba. Yes, we did. Out she came, looking like a very popular local cell phone ad for SoftBank. We forked over far too much money than I care to admit to a very relieved store clerk and walked out with the National Dog of Japan on a pink leash. She needs a name now, doesn't she? We had heard other people name their dogs cute Japanese names. At the top of that list was Sakura, which means cherry blossom. Another top contender was Sushi. Our puppy, who had already wet the floor and fell off the couch, didn't seem to fit any of those. She needed a name that represented her new tribe. A name that let you know she belonged to our family. Then it came to me. Sumimasen Gomenasai. It was the first words I had learned in our mandatory cultural manners class when we arrived. It was the words I probably said more than any others. Those words stood for, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yep, sue me for short. 
Sumi spent the better part of the next six weeks hidden under my desk in my classroom by day and keeping us up with potty breaks by night. She was too young to be left alone. We were finally settled on base and Sumi was just big enough to get up a stair and teething. She was living up to her breed standard as a cat-like drama queen on all fronts. Collar? Nope. Regular dog food? I think not. In a kennel? Um, I'm dog royalty. Move over. I'm sleeping in the bed. One day, I found her in my closet chewing on a brand new pair of shoes that took me six weeks to have shipped from the States. Another day, I found her tearing apart my clothes in my hamper. This means war. Sumi finally put me over the edge when I found her eating yet another pair of very expensive shoes that had belonged only to me. She never went after my husband's things or anything that belonged to the kids. What's the deal? The internet promptly told me that she was exhibiting proper pack behavior. She was vying for the coveted spot of alpha female, and I was her main competition. Well, Furball, you are not winning this round. Query, how do you let a dog know that you are the alpha? Answer, according to many, is bite her on the ear. The next day, that dog went searching for a shoe-sized teething ring in my closet again, and I took it upon myself to ensure we were all clear on this alpha issue. After a very dramatic reaction and subsequent pouting session, Sumi and I were on the same page. The Sumi shenanigans continued as she figured out how to get out of the gate. It happened so frequently that it felt as if we were calling for man overboard drills every time she got out. We always knew that she, we could find her in one of two places, the smoke pit or at the fence where a rather handsome sesame Sheba named Pedro lived. One stormy night, she decided she was afraid of the sound that our stove vent made because of the wind. And that night, she began sleeping in our bed all of the time. Seriously, though, our little life in Japan with our Japanese puppy was quickly coming to an end. It was almost time to pack up and head back to the States. The March 11th happened. In short, the earth shook, the tsunami came, the power plant flooded, and then all hell broke loose. The decision to evacuate was made, and everybody, including the dog, was on the next available flight out. As you can imagine, there are a lot of emotions attached to this story. For Sumi, it meant getting a health check to get cleared to fly. She also needed to get in that kennel, which was the equivalent to giving a cat a bath. I took her to the hangar where the vet staff had set up shop. While we waited over three hours, Sumi became more and more alarmed. The only time she calmed down was when the base chaplain came over and gave her a small blessing and a quick pet behind the ears. Through all of this pandemonium, through all of that chaos, I kept it together like a good Navy wife should. First, we closed our house and made a wish that everything we owned wouldn't wind up at the bottom of the Pacific. We arranged our flights. Then I kissed my husband goodbye. He had to stay with his command. I boarded a flight with one dog, three kids, and a ton of luggage. We said goodbye to Japan, a country we had come to love and respect. Through all of that, I never shed a tear. Then it happened. As we landed at O'Hare International Airport, I was exhausted. With customs to clear and another leg to D.C. to endure, we exited the plane to collect our things. In baggage claim, all of our suitcases were accounted for, and we waited for the oversized cargo door for Sumi's crate. She was one of seven dogs on our flight, and six crates had been waiting. Where was Sumi? Minutes passed by and nothing. It was at this moment, in the middle of baggage claim, in the international terminal, that it all caught up with me. I sat on the edge of the belt, and the tears just came. And bless my handfuls, they all tried to comfort me. Then it happened. I heard it a little yip. On the other side of the hall, a little commotion had begun. And I knew that was my girl. That dog that I didn't want. That dog that caused me so much work and ate too many shoes, I knew that girl was mine. We were so very relieved to see our fluffy white dog that looked just like an Arctic fox. She belonged with us. She was part of our pack. 
Little did we know, we learned more about the Shiba breed. For example, in certain corners of Japan, it's said that a Shiba is not chosen. Instead, a Shiba chooses you. In fact, some go as far as to believe that once a Shiba has made up its mind, it can go to no other. Gosh, that really explained that relieved salesman back at Viva Home. These days, Sumi still runs away if she can, but only to wait out in the yard so that she can get a treat when she's called back inside. She still sleeps on our bed, making sure one paw is touching me and the other one touching my husband. Most of all, she is still the center of attention in most matters. If she is not, you can put money on the fact that she is pouting or giving you some serious side eye in her very passive aggressive way. Shebas are like that. The travel industry has taken quite a blow from several global issues, including the war in Ukraine, the COVID-19 crisis, and inflation that makes it hard for people to get out into the world like they want to. At this point, leading experts are predicting that it is going to take up to three years for the travel industry to bounce back to full force. One way that you can help is to like and subscribe to 10 Microbloggers. Start with us. You can like and subscribe to our podcast and our website so that you can tell the travel industry that people are still interested in travel. So, Terry, how can listeners get a hold of us? We'd like to hear from you. Contact us at bobshianyaya at gmail.com with your questions, suggestions, favorite travel tips, products and travel trends so that we can share your ideas in the future. You can find us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and LinkedIn. Here you go, guys. Bobshi and Yaya. B-A-B-C-I-A and Y-I-A-Y-I-A. Bobshianyaya.com is the home base for everything that we love about travel. And it's where we show, where we store our show notes, as well as many of the resources that we offer to our travel community, including travel literacy for the kiddos. We always have new posts about all the things we love and about all the travel we're up to, including today's topic, as well as features on destinations, travel lifestyle, and stories to make you smile. Didn't get all that? Just check out our show notes for all of the ways to stay in touch and links to anything we chatted about in this episode. As always, thanks for joining us for our journey.